Romeo Music is the leader in audio, video, music, and lighting technology for educators. With a combined nearly 200 years of experience, Romeo Music's subject matter experts understand the struggles that face teachers in today's music classrooms. With a laser focus on educational technology, Romeo Music provides a turnkey solution. Everything from audio cables to on-site training. To learn more, visit www.romeomusic.net. Hello, and welcome to Bandstand, the official podcast of the Tennessee Bandmasters Association. I'm your host, David Adelit, and I hope you'll join us on a journey through the past, present, and future of bands in Tennessee. We'll delve into the rich history of Tennessee bands, uncovering the hidden gems and legendary figures who shaped the state's band landscape. We'll survey the present, where you'll meet the movers and shakers of today, gaining insights from their expertise and experiences. And we'll gaze towards the future, exploring the exciting possibilities that await Tennessee's school bands. Hello, this is Joel Denton, and it is my honor and privilege to nominate Ron Rogers for induction to the Tennessee Bandmasters Hall of Fame. Ron and I have been friends for over 40 years, and I've had opportunity to watch him throughout his career. But some of you may not know all this information about him, so I thought I would share some. He grew up in Corrington, Tennessee, outside of Knoxville, and attended Gibbs High School, where he was an all-state trombone player and also an integral part of their basketball team. Upon graduating from Gibbs, he attended the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, that's where we met, receiving his Bachelor of Music education. His first job was at Rutledge High School along with David Romines, where they produced an outstanding band program. Following his short tenure at Rutledge, he moved to Doyle High School, where he would take a storied program that had been uh, led in the past by People like Tony D'Andrea, Roy and June Holder, and John Culverhouse. Ron, again, built on that solid foundation, produced an outstanding band program that performed at the grade six concert level. After a few years at Doyle, he had the opportunity to move to Farragut High School, where he would follow his high school band director, S.L. Valentine. This is where Ron really demonstrated his unique teaching abilities as he produced bands and grew a program that was a model for us across our state. The Wind Ensemble there performed twice at the CBD and AMBA regional conferences and was the first band to perform at the Bands of America National Concert Festival, now known as the Music for All National Festival. After a few years, like almost 30, Ron left there and moved to William Blunt High School, where he would spend the last 10 years of his career. In the time that Ron was there, he produced all East players, all state players, and a concert band that was performing at the grade six level, receiving all superior ratings. This is enough to make Ron eligible for our Hall of Fame, but I think his service to our profession elevates him even more. He has served as president of every organization in our state that he was eligible to be present, president of, serving twice as president of the East Tennessee School Band and Orchestra Association. He served as president of Phi Beta Mu. He served as president of the Tennessee Music Education Association and just completed a term as president of the Tennessee Bandmasters Association. Ron has received the National Band Association Citation of Excellence four times, 
and served for six years as the National Band Association State Chair to further elevate his eligibility and demonstrate why he should be in our Hall of Fame. Ron continues to give back to instrumental music education across our state, visiting with band directors and their students, encouraging them, helping them, supporting them, and teaching them, modeling for them what excellence looks like. Along with that, he has taken a personal responsibility in ensuring that the history of ETSBOA is preserved making literally decades of recordings from our concert festivals and other events available to members online. When I think of the giants of the past, I think of a giant of the present. My friend, Ron Rogers. He is most deserving, and I am honored to have been the one to nominate him. Congratulations, Ron. We're joined today by Joel Denton, one of our TBA Hall of Fame members, and Ron Rogers, who, along with Nola Jones, will be inducted into the Tennessee Bandmasters Hall of Fame next month at the TMEA conference. Welcome, Ron. Welcome, Thank Joel. You. Hey. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Joel, can you talk just a little bit about the process of nominating Ron? Like maybe when you started thinking about it, what the process is like for the nomination, a little bit of that stuff. Well, uh, I started thinking about it uh, when I was nominated. And uh, Ron had not retired at that point. Uh, and so uh, when he did retire, uh, you know, I knew his I knew his background. I mean, we've been friends for over forty years, and I knew all of his accomplishments. And uh, I thought, well, this is a logical person to nominate for the Hall of Fame. I mean, um, when we talk about his bio later, we we can revisit this. But he's been president of every major organization that he was eligible to be president in our state. ETSBOA, TBA, 5AWU, and T TMEA. And he's one of the few people uh, I'm following in his steps next year with TMEA. He, he, we're one of the a few people that have, been a, that have been asked to serve in that capacity in every organization. And um, I just thought, you know, when you, when you look over the span of his career and all that he's contributed to... Uh, not just East Tennessee, but to the state. Um, he he was a, a logical person. So then you you have to get a bio. You have to have everything ready. So you have to have a bio and a picture. Uh, Ron sent me a, a, a basically a resume as well, or a, a, a Vita. Uh, and so I had those things ready. And then at the band booster, I mean the Tennessee Bandmaster meeting, you have to nominate them. And so. Um, it was easy for me. I had his bio prepared, uh, but it was easier for me just to talk about my friend, who's extremely worthy of this uh, nomination, this honor. And so uh, uh, he was elected, you know, uh, by acclamation. Yeah, there was and, nobody uh, voting no on that. <laughs> no, no. No, there would have been a fight had there not this kid. Oh, I know you East Tennessee yeah. guys. Yeah, you get a little crazy up there. So, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm mean, I'm excited for him uh, to to receive that recognition. Absolutely. I, I well deserved. Like Do you two remember when you first met? 1978 at UT, Ron. Is that right? It was my, my freshman year yeah. at UT. So, uh, Ron, what does this mean to you? Oh, it's, uh, you know, I, I think any time that you have something like this that shows that you're well-respected or well-thought of by your peers, it, it, it's something special. You know, I look at people, you know, like Joel being in it, uh, Jay Julian being in it, Zeke Niker being in it, Stanley mm -hmm. Barnes being in it, all these people who I idolized for so many years 
and to think that you're sort of becoming a part of that now is really very humbling whenever it comes right down to it. It's the giants of the past. That, that list is an impressive list of people. And your name's going to be on it. It's, and like well I say, that's very humbling and very flattering both, yes. Uh, can you just take a second, Ron, maybe three or four minutes and just tell us your life story? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I'll be I'll be 64 coming up. So I was born in 1960. I, I was raised actually in rural Union County until I was almost six years old. And my mom and dad moved to Knox County because they wanted me to have a better, I almost hate to say this because it, I, I'm not casting aspersions on Union County. They thought the schools were better in Knox County. Yes. And so I started at Gibbs Elementary School, which is part of the Knox County school system. And, you know, Gibbs was of the size. I was I was in the same building for 11 of 12 years. I mean, it was just a very small, you know, I graduated mm-hmm. in 1978 uh, in a class of 102. So it's not like some, some of the schools mm-hmm. I've worked for since. But uh, I started, you know, in, at that time in Knox County, you could start band in the fifth grade. And I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. And so finally, a good friend of mine named Mike Tipton, who's one of the great choral people around. Now, he asked me if, as a sixth grader to come in and start. And I said, sure. So I want to play. He was a, he was a drummer. He was a percussion. So I want to play drums. And Mr. Valentine said, no, he goes, no more percussion. So I looked at this guy beside me. I go, what do you play? And he goes, trombone. I go, is it hard? He goes, no. I go, okay. Now come to find out. Okay. I I, I laugh at the person I end up asking these days uh, whenever I think about it. But anyway, so, uh, and then I, like I say, that started me on my path uh, until I was a, a junior in high school. I had never even thought about being a band director. I was going to be an architect. That's all I'd ever wanted, wanted to be. And uh, I still enjoy homes and looking at homes and stuff like that. still fascinates me. But I can remember walking into the house one day. And you have to understand, in my family, my dad and mom, me and my sister, I was going to be the first one to even go to college. And so uh, I walked in and told mom and dad that I had decided to do something besides architecture. And I'm sure they thought, He's going to be a doctor. He's going to be an attorney. And whenever I said I was going to be a band director, you thought I had a third eye on my forehead. <laughs> you know, my, my dad went, my dad was born in 1926 in rural Union County. My mom in 1929 was raised in Union. So, I mean, the band was not even an option for them, much less to think about being a music educator. And so, anyway, so I, I, I can still remember. When I got, I bought, mom and dad bought me my first trombone whenever I was getting ready to go into the seventh grade. It was a Holton TR-680. I think they paid $329 for it. My dad was not a happy man. Not a happy man. I mean, I mean you know, he came, he came in and he put it down. He said, play us something. Yeah, he was just not happy. But then uh, my senior year, he told me, he said, son, if you make all state, I'll buy you another horn. Something for college. I go, okay. And so I made, I was second chair blue band. I made all state my senior year. And I can still remember my dad walking in with an envelope and handed it to me. It had eight $100 bills in it. He said, go buy your horn. And so I went out and bought a Bach 42B for $700. A guy, a gentleman. Oh, that's a great a guy story. Rushes, a guy named uh, Owen McPeak, who's no longer with us, passed a few years ago. Owen was a great salesperson. And he said, a guy, whose name is Tom Bailey, who was a longtime East Tennessee band director, said Tom Bailey bar, used it for a couple of weeks and put a couple of dents in. He goes, we'll give you $100 off. And so that's the horn I still play today. I still play after all these years. So uh, anyway, so coming out, of, like I said, uh, coming out of high school or into high school, whatever. My, I only had one band director in high school and one one band director in college. That was it. My high school director was S.L. Valentine, who passed just a couple of years ago, or three or four years ago, I guess, and Jay Julian. And I could not have had two more distinctly different approaches to band than what, what they had. And they remained two of my greatest mentors for the reason sl valentine the whole reason i decided i want to be a band director i think at the time was because i realized i never felt better than i did when i was in the gibbs high school band room and i thought if he can create Mm -hmm. that atmosphere maybe i can do that too and so the sense of family that he taught was pretty remarkable and so that that's the first reason then i got to ut and just jay julian's unrelenting quest for perfection and discipline and that that became the second mm-hmm. thing for me. And so I, I, I think, to, like I say, those two mentors on two ends of the spectrum were really, really quite uh, very important to me, extremely important. I also had a basketball coach. I played basketball in high school also. And I had a basketball coach named Eldon Nicely, who was one of the great influences on me, wrote in my yearbook one year. He said, uh, remember, inspira- uh, success is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. 
And so that, that's an attitude I took to my bands every year, but just someone else that contributed to my upbringing on stuff. Uh, you know, we, I, 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 I think about, about all, all the important people in my growing up as far as becoming a band director. And like I guess I mentioned S.L. Valentine and Jay Julian, but I was fortunate enough then, I'm sorry, I was fortunate enough then to do my student teaching with Roy and June Holder. And, and, and not, <laughs> You know, I did. And, and, you know, and not the not the Roy and June Holder that we know from Lake Braddock and other successes, West Potomac. This was Roy and June Holder trying to restart the Powell High School band program with about 30 kids. And I mean, it was just I mean, I mean, it was it was a they'd been there. That was they had come half a year before. And so they were really in their in their first full year, but their, their second. And I got to see and plus they were rebuilding the school and everything. But I got to see exactly how to put together a band from ground zero. So, I mean, I've been fortunate on many things. I, 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 my first teaching job was at Rutledge High School, which I was an assistant band director to David Romines. David and I, we, we, had, a, we had a band of about 50, 55 kids at Rutledge. I was his assistant. And so, and, and everything was great. I learned so much from David. My second year, I got a phone call and they wanted to know if I would apply in Knox County. And I said, sure, I thought it was going to be one of the small schools. They said, we'd like for you to interview for the Doyle job. John Culverhouse is leaving. In retrospect, probably not one of my greatest decisions at the time, although it turned out to be great. We had, we had great success. But you learn some people are really hard to follow. And John Culverhouse being somebody that's very, very <laughs> difficult to follow. And then four years later, I get uh, S.L. Valentine, who, who was my high school director, was also a longtime band director at Farragut. He was there, I think, 10 or 12 years. The last couple of years, he was doing half-time band directing, half-time music supervisor. The Knox County longtime supervisor, J.B. Lyle, had passed away, and Jack Cannell had been injured badly in a car wreck. And so SL was doing that. And uh, so toward the end of the year, I made a phone call and asked SL if, uh, if, I, if he thought I should apply for it. And he said, I'm surprised you haven't called me yet. He goes, I definitely think you should be applied. You should apply for it. So I applied for it in the summer of 1989. And in retrospect, no one else even applied for the job. And so I, I became band director there and stayed there for 22 years. And then I left after the 2011 year. Rob Clark, who I mentioned a minute ago, was my my former, uh, who was a former band director. In fact, I used to take him to band camp with me to work trumpet sectionals. But he was band director at William Blunt High School. And he called and asked me if I knew anybody that might make a, the next be the, the next band director, William Blunt. I go, yeah, I would. And so I went and I spent my last 10 years there. So I guess in putting together my life story from a band directing standpoint, 37 years of uh, public school teaching and one year at Carson Newman College, uh, University at, at, after all that was over. Your children, both your children here just finished this tour with UT. My son, Brett, is getting ready to graduate from the University of Tennessee with a degree in music and culture, which, I, which basically is a musicology degree. But he's getting ready to graduate and looking for mm-hmm. graduate school. And he's also the principal euphonium player in the UT Knoxville Wind Ensemble. And my daughter, Allie, is a senior bassoonist. She's been first year bassoon for a couple of years. I mean, an exceptional. In fact, she's getting ready to pursue bassoon performance as a degree in college. And he had called and uh, John Zastable called and asked if uh, she would be interested in coming along on the convention, the CBDNA NBA Southern Division Conference and playing contra bassoon on a world premiere piece, she jumped at the opportunity. So I, the only time I've gotten to see in that kind of setting, my kids play together in a concert. So it was, it was it's been a very special. That's fantastic. Well, you have such a wide array of mentors. I'm just thinking about, I'm still stuck on SL Valentine and Jay Julian and that dichotomy. When you filtered all that out into whatever Ron's purpose, core values, however you want to describe it, how has that shaped you through your life and through your career? I, I think I've been able to find ways that worked for both of them. You know, uh, uh, you know, the, the J. Julian technique, number one, even 35 years ago, would, would not have worked in, in, in high school. Just no way. And in retrospect, probably no way it should it have. But you learn some of the things, I mean, you know, I, I think the thing we that we learned, learned from J. Julian is so many things he was doing, he was doing to prepare us for situations. I remember him just ranting and going on and on about something one day. I mean, just to, to, to a couple of us, just so displeased with something. And another person said, you realize he did that probably to set you up for a band pants that's going to come in your office and do the same thing. And, I, and you're just, I mean, he was just so intelligent 
from a psychological standpoint. And I think yeah, I, I, I learned how to use some of that stuff, I think, to my advantage through the years. Uh, SL, once again, you know, that, you know, I, I was never, I, I don't want to say SL Valentine was soft because he was not soft. I was not, not maybe as fatherly as what he was at times. I mean, the, him, him being, I mean, the Farragut kids, the Gibbs kids, they would all just swear by him, you know, uh, up until his last days about what a father figure he was. And I think I was able, hopefully able to do that to some of those kids that I've taught for 37 years. You know, I'm on, I've been on Facebook almost from the very beginning as not to look at people's political posts or hearing diatribes about this and that. It's so I can see my former students and how they're doing, how their kids are doing, how their families are, to keep up with my friends who are in the, in the teaching thing. And so I want to say that maybe that father figure aspect may, may have paid off for me there too. There's so much uh, talk about culture in band right now, and as there certainly should be. And uh, for me, it's it's a little bit like brick and mortar, where you have to have that sense of the uh, the high standards. Obviously, we want to have that. We want to be excellent, but we have to do it in a way where our students understand that that's it's for them. Yes, right. It's so those those two elements must work together in order to create. The kind of things you created at Farragut and the other and and the other schools you were at. My, my first year of teaching at Doyle High School, we were getting ready to play Farragut. That's when SL was band director at Farragut, and so this was the first time that my band had been in front of his. And I can remember going to my kids and saying how much this meant to me for them to perform well. It means so much to me. It was the worst performance of the fall. And very quickly, I realized if I make this about me, I'm in trouble. And even more importantly, they're in trouble too. And so I, I think, you know, I, I learned at that point, I think not to be selfish, which I guess is some of the stuff that I'd learned from both of those directors growing up. Joel, what is, uh, what's Ron's impact on East Tennessee and the whole state? Oh, I think it's a, a truthfully uh, immeasurable. Uh, Ron is one of the few people who served two terms as president of ETSBLA. Mm -hmm. uh, he served on the board for a lot of years, but uh, he served uh, when we used to do uh, one term and then you moved to pass president. Uh, then you, you were kind well, of gone, yeah, Ron. My, my right? first time was when you could serve two terms from, I guess, two yeah, terms. That's right. Like, so four years. And then I came back and was renominated, I guess, 10 years later or whatever uh, in, in between the and that was when we had yes. gone to the two years of president-elect, yes. two years of president. So, and and when you look back at the things that he helped lead us in, and I, uh, I mean, those were monumental steps in uh, propelling ETSBOA forward. Uh, when I look back on our history, we had all these amazing people but they weren't very good at business and they weren't very good at building uh, for the future of the organization. They were very good at doing their band jobs, but not necessarily always having the vision of how to ensure the legacy of ETSBOA. And I think Ron helped secure that. Uh, uh, he was one of the, the first presidents to serve in that three year uh, three term, you know, two year cycle, mm -hmm. six years uh, in that, and uh, and then then I saw the same thing when he was TBA president. He's he's so so well respected across the uh, state. When you look at the Hall of Fame, that's one of the interesting things. Uh, it's the giants from all over the state, and they were truly giants who made an impact. And so he's most deserving of that. And then uh, he. Maybe the most endearing thing that uh, has very little to do with what we've done in the past is uh, Ron continues to serve. He has no official capacity, uh, but he spends hours archiving uh, our history, uh, all these recordings of bands, um, amazing performances of bands, but also some bands who were not maybe super incredible, but they were still a part of the structure mm -hmm. of our history. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things that we should value mm -hmm. is uh, our service to our uh, 
profession, our associations, and our associations should focus on not just those who are able to achieve at the highest level, but those who are providing opportunities for students who may never get it any other no, way. You're singing my song and, right now. Uh, oh, oh, I know. Yep. And, and mine too. And uh, I appreciate that Ron has been so invested in ensuring that many of our members are represented in these archives, not just those who played in grade six, who received outstanding accolades, but those who were developing bands playing in the lower classifications and, and, and uh, who had band directors who produced band mm -hmm. directors uh, mm -hmm. who created that culture we were just talking about that inspired people to want to become like their band director, like Ron has yeah. just said. Yes. Well, I, I can remember from what Joel just said. I can remember whenever I was in college. Maybe this is where my archival instincts happen. I remember sitting in, in, in the you know you, you, at those days the, the ETSBOA concert festival was always held at UT, always in the always in the music building at UT. Mm -hmm. And I can remember sitting with a cassette player in my lap for two and three days recording different bands. And, you know, because I mean, I mean that, that, you know, you didn't have the means to go online and download recordings, whatever. And so some of my earliest knowledge of band of, of concert band music was through these recordings that I would go and record of different groups. And they, it, you know, I, I just, you know, something else Joel had said, you know, about, you know, still trying to serve. I went up, you know, I went up to Maryville College a couple weeks ago and helped with helped Jenny DeAndrea run concert festival. And somebody said, why are you why are you doing that? And I go, because these are the people I enjoy being around. And this is this is my activity. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the, mm -hmm. I mean, I may be retired, but I still want bands to do great stuff and be at you know the director's disposal if they need any help on stuff. So that's it's just what I what I still enjoy doing more than anything. Yeah, and when you're when you're not playing, you know, when you're if you play on Tuesday or whatever, go back a couple of days if you can. After that, it's you know, it's uh, Carolyn Hankins talked about this on the the podcast about how to have a good day at the CPA. She said. Basically, like if you're in warm up and a bass clarinet breaks, don't spend your time fixing that horn. Go find somebody that can do that. Go find a Ron Rogers that's hanging out there mm -hmm, the, that's mm -hmm. probably there at the building and ask them for help. Well, can I can I add another thing is that uh, when you look at the giants of the past and Ron is one of those, uh, you see that after they did retire, they continue to give back to the profession uh, and, and, you know, uh, Ron's in a lot of band rooms, uh, help, helping people get ready for CPA. Uh, he's he's visiting with directors. He's he's availing himself. And we did have great models. Uh, you know, Roy and June Holder moved back to East Tennessee and immediately started visiting band rooms. They were in the Boudoir band room a lot. And um, I think I think when we look at those people, Ron named some of them that. Are from all across our run. Joanne Hood, Rick Murphy, Nola Jones is about to go in the Hall of Fame with Ron. When you look at those people, just because they retired didn't mean they quit. Mm -hmm. they're, they're still investing in younger band directors, helping them find their way. Uh, and is that not what you we know, should be doing? Joel, as, I never had. As, an old, an old, I say older, a veteran band director ever say no to me whenever I invite him to the band room. And so, you yeah. know, I, I'm not one that just goes and, yeah. and, and comes by, but, you know, I, I, if, if somebody asks me to come out and I think you would, both of you would do the same thing, you'll find a way to do it. You'll find a way to do it. We, we owe them that. We owe them that much. The band directors that create band directors, we need that. <laughs> we, we need that. We need, we need students that go into this profession for the reasons with the servant's heart. And uh, I don't know how we can create that. It's something that concerns me. I don't know what the numbers are like. I don't know if our numbers in for freshman music education majors are up or down, but it, my sense is that they're down. Joel's saying down. Well, there's an alarming trend that was never present in uh, band directing until about five or six years ago. It started right before COVID, but COVID really contributed to it. Uh, and up until about 2010, about 50% of music educators would leave the profession in somewhere between five and seven years. 
that that number is closer to three years now, 50% in three years. But the alarming thing is that if a band director made it to 10 years, they were probably a lifer. And now we have people leaving the profession in droves 12 or 15 years in. Um, and, you know, part of that, I think, is we have to, and this is why I think what you're doing here and what Ron does and hopefully what I do and others are doing uh, with our younger directors will help and sustain them is uh, they either don't feel like they're getting to a place where they can be successful or some in other, not, not necessarily in Tennessee a lot, even though it's happened here, but in some other places in the country, they feel like they've accomplished everything they need to accomplish and they're 33, 35, and they're ready to go, you know, program marching bands. And oh, yeah. Che- the yeah, they're checking all the boxes, played Rose Parade, Macy's in the Midwest. Yeah. See you later. Bye. Yes. See you. See bye. And it's like, you know, well, what about those people around you that haven't yes. done that? What can you do to help them find their way? Uh, because something drew them to the profession. So, back in the uh, back in the early days of, of my teaching, and I'm, I'm not this is not an advertisement I'm giving for anyone. One of the one of the major music stores in East Tennessee was Rush's Music, and still is. Uh, but every Monday afternoon, you'd bring your repairs in, you'd do this, and you'd drop it off, and then go to the back room. And that's where everybody was sitting and talking. And you, you most you, everybody would take the refreshments and some food or whatever. And you may stay there till eight thirty or nine o'clock. And but people like Stanley Barnes, Larry Hicks, Rick Best were holding court. And you know, for a young person like me, all I would all I would do is sit there with my mouth shut. I mean, I just I, I was not going to interject. But that was so important. In fact, I'm actually one of the things I'm going to talk to the new owner of Rushes here soon to see if she might be interested in maybe trying to resurrect that. Just at some place mm-hmm. where these young directors, or not even necessarily young directors, but old directors come too, and just sit and talk and listen and learn. Because we, like you said, we, we don't get enough moments like that. You know, wherever we are in professional development, it's usually to figure out how to use the grade book or figure out better ways to manage mm-hmm. lunchtime or whatever. As far as just going and, and talking about new literature or new techniques or this or whatever. We don't. We don't simply don't do that anymore. And this, and, and I, I think yeah. we have opportunities that are available to us if we can, if we can, uh, if we if we can ever get around to doing it. I guess. I will say when I started teaching, uh, and you know I spent my whole career at Ultawa, and and one of the things that I was so jealous of is I couldn't drive to Knoxville for the rushes meeting, and those guys. We're doing that like once every, every on a Monday, regular every, basis, every, uh, every Monday, and and that was that was where the people who had the had had the most influence on me early in my career. I mean, they're all in the Hall of Fame now. You know, when you when you look at Rick Rick Best and Roy Holder and and Stanley Barnes and Dwight Christian, John Abel and and. Uh, uh, Oh, uh, Chet Hedgecoth, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'll leave names out when you start calling names. But all those guys were the guys that you wanted to talk to. And then I taught a little while, and I started making friends in Middle Tennessee. And then I started hearing about your monthly meetings, and I was like, we don't have those. And and I was so envious of that and the camaraderie. I love the fact that. You know, Rick Murphy and Joanne Hood could go fight each other at a contest on Saturday and then go to a meeting on Tuesday and be best mm-hmm. friends. And, uh, you know, it, I think seeing that is a, a very, something that's very missing in present day band directing uh, because it's easy to get focused on the trophies. It's easy to get focused on the literature, the grade level. It's easy to get focused on how many kids you got in all uh, mid state or all, all state east or all state west. Or it's easy to get focused on that. And I think those older people did a great job of creating camaraderie and and letting people see that just because their programs look like they were you know, 
ice castles, that they had vulnerable things mm -hmm. in their programs too. They had to fight battles every day too. It, was, it, was, it wasn't, you know, they just weren't up there on some platitude, and, but it was a daily struggle to, to produce uh, that, kind of, that kind of work. And I hope this podcast goes a long way towards, in a modern age, creating that kind of conversation. Amro, Amro Music used to do the same thing in Memphis, except it was Saturday morning. And I, 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 cause I taught in West Tennessee for four years when I started and it was about two hours from where Renee and I lived. But once in a while I was down there and I would just drop into Amro and go upstairs and there's, you know, folks up there talking about band and in a conversational, casual way. And so I hope that this podcast can become something of that replacement. I'm not, I'm not tooting my horn when I say this. I, I want to go back to what Ron said. The giants never said no. Uh, when I left UT, uh, we didn't have Facebook and we didn't have cell phones. and So uh, I had a list of phone numbers, some that I'd gotten from working with those great Knoxville band directors and East Tennessee band directors, some from Dr. Julian that he said, call this person. And th some of these were the best of the best. I mean, they, they, they were the other university band directors. I never called anyone who would not mm. talk to me. And if it was someone doc told me to call, I would call them and say, hey, Dr. Julian gave me your number and said you'd be a great person to call. And immediately they were in. Uh, but the other thing is we didn't have, I mean, we did have good camaraderie in Chattanooga. I don't want to belittle that. But we didn't have those kind of weekly meetings or monthly meetings. So uh, I would just ask people to come work with the band. It just so happened that Roy Holder took a little break and did fundraising. Bill Hall was doing fundraising. Uh, oh, who was the other guy? Uh, I see his, uh, Brad Kitty yep. was doing fundraising. And they would come Chuck to my Campbell band. Chuck Campbell did it for a while, too. Yeah, yeah, Chuck never came down to Chattanooga because Roy was kind of hooked up with him. But they would say, or Jay Larry Moore never came down, but they would say, hey, will you do a, will you do a fundraiser? And I'll say, well, I'll talk to you about it after you do this. <laughs> and, and I would watch them teach. And, you know, and I would call Harold Wilmoth, who was my high school band director, who's in the East Tennessee Hall of Fame, and say, hey, Mr. Wilmoth, you come listen to my band. And then Tony DeAndrea moved to Chattanooga. He became a regular visitor in my band room. Jack Connell, before he was deceased, uh, Mark and Bill used to get mad because Bill was in South Carolina or, or Alabama. Mark was in Georgia. And they said, you see him twice as much <laughs> as we do because I would see him going and coming. And, uh, you know, the, the thing is, you don't have to do this job alone. There's a lot of people out there who will help you. And, and that's what makes our Hall of Fame so special is those people are still uh, available, many of them. Uh, my, my first year I taught at Doyle, and Joel will remember part of this. We had our senior clinic at McMinn County High School. And we, we housed everybody oh, yeah. at Snuffy's Best Western Inn right there at exit 49 off the interstate, which is still people our age still talk about it. But the hospitality room often, after we put the kids to bed, the hospitality room would stay alive for quite a while. And I can remember Stanley Barnes coming over to me. He goes, he goes, Ron, let's get you back here. He goes, we're going to figure out how to make you a one for festival. And he and John Abel took me back in a corner and talked to me till probably 3 a.m. And finally we figured out we're going to, that I was going to play Carmina Burana. So I go back and we start working on it. And later on, that's a couple weeks before festival, I have Stanley out to work the piece. And Stanley's longtime assistant was a gentleman named Bill Sparks. I don't, I don't know how many people even know him outside of East Tennessee. Bill Sparks was one of the most brilliant men musically and other other way otherwise too that you'd ever know but anyway stanley and bill came out and stan was going to work uh, the rehearsal so he was up working the rehearsal at doyle and uh sparks is back there with me he goes ron you know stanley didn't know this piece and i go oh, really he goes no he just wants you to do well and that meant all the wor world to me mm -hmm. for somebody of his stature i mean he'd already played midwest seven or eight years before that with the clinton band and played nba and all this kind of stuff and just because he wanted me to do well meant all the world to me. And so and I think I think there's a lot of a lot of people out yeah. here that really just want people to do well. I really think so. What is your message to the young directors? Uh, I love, uh, you know, first of all, I'm amazed how many good ones are out there. 
And I don't, I don't say mm-hmm. that disparagingly. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are some incredible teachers out there you know, where, where I'm yes. fortunate enough to go out and work with. And I, I'll come home, tell my wife, she'll go, how was it? I go, it was really good. It was really, really good. Uh, and I, th- I think one of the things that, that, that I want to tell them is, I, I'm, this is my, my wife, since we built this sunroom, she can watch birds and she has a, an alarm clock that sounds like birds making sounds like that's, that's what that was. But uh, anyway, but, but as I go out to these, and I, I love it. And, and she, my wife will say, how was I? I say, it was really good. And I'll say, you know, I actually, you know, I picked up something from this or I really like the way that they did this. I think in retrospect, I'm not in retrospect, but just in thinking about what I would tell them is stay the path, stay the path. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's not going to be it's not going to be easy every day. In fact, there are probably more and more difficult days than there are good ones. But what's that Gloria Gaynor song? You will survive. You, you'll, you'll come mm-hmm. through it strong. In fact, you'll come mm-hmm. through it stronger for for holding your way on stuff. You know, and it's uh, that, that's that's what I would tell them is to hold the path and don't be afraid to reach out. I'm not saying necessarily ask me, but there you know I just think of here in East Tennessee you know you've got in just an area, in the middle area alone you know you've got Wayne Dorothy here you have John Culver House here you know you have Teddy DeAndrea yeah. who's a, a, a two hours away in Chattanooga you know you have all these people retired directors who would be flattered flattered for, for, mm-hmm. for people and you know and people do ask and it's not like I'm never get asked out people do ask me to come out and do stuff but you know stay the path and don't be afraid to ask for help and advice in doing stuff. I think there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic. We do have some really great young ones yes. right now that are doing some some really great work. And I think doing it in a way that would make the elders proud, so to speak. They're being vulnerable. They're asking for help. They're doing those kinds of things. Bad, bad directing is a lot like golf. It's that one great shot that keeps bringing you back. And, and you know, it's true. Every day is not perfect. But when you make that connection with the kids or they turn that phrase exactly the way you wanted them to or, or they play a, a release that makes all the little hairs on the back of your neck stand up or you get an email from a kid you taught five years before who's graduating college and they're doing great mm-hmm. things or maybe, maybe they're about to become a band director. Uh, it, you know, it just reminds you that it is mm-hmm. worthwhile. My, 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 my is wife worthwhile. is a very, very intelligent person. She, she was a band. She was a, a band person herself, a, a very, very fine flute player today. Uh, she told me something that that opened my eyes. She goes, "You, honey, you have to understand. Sometimes kids need band more than what band needs the kid." And mm-hmm. you know, and, and I mean, in the twenty-two years I was at Farragut, you know, I, I you know, it's a upper middle class, very white collar community. You know, I had. Like for four straight years, I had I had kids that had made perfect scores on their ACT. I mean, you know, some years we'd have in, in the prime, we'd have 50, 55 kids in all state East. Things going really, really well. I go to William Blunt, which was not, it's not, not a bad situation, just a very much different situation than what Farragut was from a socioeconomic standpoint and stuff. And I remember my first couple years there, my wife told me, she goes, honey, you realize you did a better job of teaching there than what you ever did at Farragut. Well, I, I will echo that because uh, uh, he, he took uh, a band that was a good band. And he turned it into a great mm-hmm. band when he left. Playing grade six, doing exceptional things, and the kids have to buy into the belief system. And that is not immediate. That process. is not immediate. And maybe that's but, something else I would tell young directors too. M- my first year at Farragut, I had 62 kids not signed back up that could have signed up. They just, you know, they, they did not like the way I was doing stuff. But 21 years later, everything was okay. And so, so maybe mm-hmm. tell these guys, you know, it's not going to be easy at first. It's not going to be easy. Hold the path and things will be okay. And it's okay to fail. It's okay to, to, to taste humble pie uh, because it makes you stop and figure out what you're doing wrong or what you could do better. And even when you are at the pinnacle of your career, uh, there will be times when you need to reevaluate what you're doing and realize that maybe, maybe the climate has changed and the culture needs to be mm-hmm. updated. And, and, and you, you, so, you, but you are the per, you're the salesman. Uh, you're, you're the, you're the person who has the finger on the pulse of the program and you just can't ever take that. You can't take that hand off. You've got to make sure 
you know what's going on with the mm -hmm. kids. Ron, I'd like to ask you about this archival project uh, you have. Uh, it's probably been 10 years ago. There's a gentleman Joel probably knows. I'd never met him. He's a Chattanooga, Northern Georgia guy named Arthur Suits. Apparently, Art was a band director in Northern mm -hmm. Georgia and maybe in the Chattanooga at one time. But uh, the, the people knew that I had this great love for trying to preserve things and had just really gotten started on some old records or whatever. And so David Butler comes up to Allstate East or the fall meeting, whatever, with a trumpet case. Hands it to me, open it up, and it's been hollowed out, and it's full of cassettes. Apparently, Arthur Suits used to come from 1970 to around 1990 to the university to ETSBOA concert festival at UT Knoxville, as well as the Brainerd Festival in Chattanooga. And he would sit there for two and three days and record every band that played on just a little handheld recorder, or you know, like a, a shoebox size recorder. And so uh, during the pandemic. I went ahead and I bought a really nice, I used my credit at McKay's and bought some, a really nice Audio-Technica turntable, bought an Ion uh, cassette deck with USB transfer capabilities, and bought an old reel, bought a 1979 Pioneer reel-to-reel -reel recorder. And VC oh, Adcock, wow. who was an East Tennessee person, had been, been passed away many years, but he brought me a box of old reel-to-reels of the early 1960s concert festivals. And so during the pandemic, I was able to get started. And so far, I, you know, I, I think right now, if you go to ETSBOA Archives, that's our YouTube channel, I think we have 325 or so of these concert festivals Incredible. recording up with probably another thousand to go. Joey Cole, the band director of Seymour, one of my former students from Farragut, is doing the YouTube transfer stuff and setting everything up. But uh, I went up and listened to the Jefferson County Band the other night. And Jessica Poole, their director, gave me an old record from 1967 of the Jefferson High School before it even came Jefferson County, of their band that their director had recorded and had had recorded and made into a record in 1967. I think I've recorded about 125 records from East Tennessee. Uh, I have senior clinic all the way back to 1966, which I think is the first year that we even mm -hmm. recorded a senior clinic. And so we are just as I digitize these, I'm passing them on, and you know I I, I put out a call pretty regular for East Tennessee people to to go, go through their closets and see what they find. I wanted, uh, the year I taught at Carson Newman, I was also a uh, supervising student teachers. And I had a student teacher that was a uh, student teaching at, at Carnes High School. And so I went over just to do my observation of him one day. And so their band director comes out with a big box and just puts it in front of me. And it's a box full of old reel to reels of Carnes High School through the years. And so, yeah, I'm afraid, you know, I don't know if, I don't know who else has a love to do this like what I do. I just don't want to lose it. I am terrified of us losing our history because, I mean, it, it's so rich. And I've even got a couple of Middle Tennessee recordings that I need to get to you guys. That, that uh, like I've got the Columbia mm. Band in 1973 or 72. Oh, man, they had some oh, great yeah. bands. And, 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 and what you find out, I mean, there's some great bands out there now. Well, there's some guys that could do some picking back in those days, too, as far as, as, far yeah. as this kind of stuff. And so, like I say, but I'm afraid mm -hmm. if we lose it, nobody will realize that. And, and we need to we need, we need to be able to remember and go listen to this stuff. And you know, if nothing else, I think it's pretty cool. For like, I'll get an email from now and then some band parent from one of these schools that were in one of these bands in 1970 or 71. You know, I put one up when I first started doing this of the Holston High School band in 1970. John Culverhouse was the first chair clarinet player, and he'd, he'd never he'd never heard the recording before from 50 years ago. And so that's the kind of stuff that it does my heart well whenever I know that I can make somebody happy by doing that and that I can preserve something that maybe we didn't know about. Yeah, he just did He just did a recording of some Chattanooga area bands did a, a yes. recording for Christmas, and, and I was on that. And I will say Art Suits uh, owned a music store in Chattanooga in the 70s. Uh, it was called The Music Man, and he sold me my first trumpet. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he he got his he finished his degree at UTC when I think Tony was there by then and taught for a, about 10 or 15 years in North Georgia in the 90s. But yeah, he would come up and just record every year, record the Brainerd Festival. Well, so, the, the, these recordings guys. have held up quite well to have been recorded on just an amateur cassette player. And even, you know, Tim Paul is a great friend of mine. He's a former band director to Clinton. He does church music at First Baptist of Concord. I was, and he's really top notch as far as audio stuff goes. And I said, what do I, what should I do to make these a little bit better? He goes, nothing. He goes, that's one of the joys of them is to 
for him to have that quality of 1970 or 75, whatever. And so I just, I mean, I, I leave him alone. I just, I, I edit any edit the ending mm-hmm. and leave him alone. And so what, what, what they get is what was probably being heard that day. Just go to YouTube and type in, and type in okay. E-T-S-B-O-A archives, A-R-C-H-I-V-E-S. And, uh, and, 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 and you, we, we create a YouTube channel because we, the, the amount of stuff that we had, that I have that we're hopefully getting ready to upload pretty soon. We didn't think we had the bandwidth for it or the space. I don't know. I, I, that may be the better word, but YouTube, I, I, we, we think it's unlimited. The number of things we can put up there and we're going to try. Yeah. We're going to try. I just think that if anyone who hears this and, and knows about Ron's career will agree that he is most deserving. Very kind. Of Very kind. Honor. Okay, Ron. It's a little bit trivial, but I did this with Nola and it was great. So what are your top three memories? I, I, I think number one was something we talked about a few minutes ago is watching both my kids perform together with the University of Tennessee Knoxville Wind Ensemble at the Southern Division CBDNA NBA Conference. Uh, whenever, I, whenever I first got to Farragut, I mean, Mr. Mr. Valentine had done wonderful things. But, you know, the, the concert band stuff was, was not, not where it needed to be. And so my second year there, I had a kid named Andy Neeland who brought me a cassette of the University of Minnesota band with Frank Ben Crescito playing a David Holsinger piece called In the Spring at the time when kings go off to war. And it had all kinds of, you know, very contemporary things, a lot of uh, aleatoric type methods and stuff like that. I actually had to call David Holsinger at his church in Texas to ask him how to do a few of the things. But we performed it for festival. And I still have a video of it. It's on my Facebook page. People went crazy. And that was one, one, and I don't want to say, you know, that almost sounds selfish, but there was that feeling that maybe we had some stuff rolling here now that maybe that maybe we continue with. And I, I look back on that performance that day, and that's what started everything going with the concert program at Farragut. For the next 20 years, I think we could back, go back to that one performance. I think that's it. Uh, hmm. Gosh, my third memory. I, I, there's so many stuff like this. I mean, where, 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 we get, where we get to sit and talk and I'm not talking about just this, the honor. I mean, that's a great, it's, it's wonderful. But being around, I guess that's a very general thing, but being around people and being able to talk about things we love, be that the students, what we've done. You know, we used to do a thing. Remember I was at Farragut, every Tuesday and Thursday night, we would go to O'Charlie's. I think it almost became legendary in, in the area. And we would, we would get a back corner table and start eating wings and whatever and talk band. And some nights you look around, there'd be 15 and 20 people, band directors, that had come out that night to sit around and do that. I mean, to the point one year, somebody called it the Deep West Knoxville Band Roundtable and got in-service credit for it. But I think looking looking around and seeing other people having the same love for stuff that that, that you do, that, that, that we do, I think that's a very special time to know that, that, that we're, we're not out there on an island by ourselves and there are people out there with us. That's a pretty good top three. I'll take that. That's good. Ron, anything else you'd like to address? I just thank you for wanting to do this. And not just this episode, as we talked earlier, I think this, this has been such a tremendous, tremendous asset for, for, for our directors. Everybody that I talk to, every director in East Tennessee, another place I talk mm-hmm. to, I say, you've got to start listening to this. If you're not already, already, but I think you'd be very pleased with the number of people who are already very much, very much in tune with it. I, it's, it's been fun. You know, I just, I think, uh, you know, I try to do ready, fire, aim on a lot of stuff. And cause I think we get hung up on the aim part sometimes. And, uh, this is definitely that because I go back and listen to the first couple episodes and I'm like, man, okay. I, I think so. it's just, a, I think it's great. To be, I mean, where all, all, all the people, I, I almost want to say kids, all the directors have to do is go and click on a link and hear. And, it's, and, and you know, like we did the yeah. stuff, you know, like I said, the stuff with Barry Krause was so great. The stuff with John Zastful was, was so great. You know, just knowing this and this and this, I, I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing for, for the directors of Tennessee and the TBA to, to be able to take advantage of. Well, the thing we've started recently is the mic check yes. on Monday, which is just a little two minute. Basically, it's like band church on on Monday morning. Both of you are so well spoken and have such great insight. If you ever want to just do a recording of I mean, what happened, like Carol Gocher has done one where he takes a quote 
and then he sort of expounds on it and makes it relate to band. If you ever have the desire or feel so motivated, just record it on your phone, on your voice recorder and text it to me and I'll, we'll just put it up because I would love to have a lot of voices and it route through that mic check Great. part of it. So, David, I want to thank you for uh, your article. Oh, thank you. In the NBA journal. Thank you. But that was Randall. He, uh, he emailed me after I finished all that stuff and asked if they could be published. And so I submitted it and uh, to Dr. Talbert, and there it was. Thank you for saying yeah, that. It was great. Yes. Thanks, guys. Thank awesome. you. Thanks, Bye. guys. Yep. Bye. Thanks for listening to Bandstand. If you have topic suggestions or need to get in touch with us, email us at tbabandstandpodcast at gmail.com. Your input is important to us. And if you have a topic you'd like us to discuss about the past, present, or future of Tennessee bands, please let us know. Again, that email is tbabandstandpodcast at gmail.com. Right now, we're broadcasting on Spotify and YouTube, so please subscribe, review, and rate. Box 5, please. And more importantly, share this podcast with your friends. See you next week. Bye.